For as the light of the morning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, and covereth the whole earth, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Therefore sanctify yourselves, that your minds become single to God, and the days will come that you shall see him. For he will unveil his face unto you, and it shall be in his own time and in his own way, and according to his own will. This is Unveiling Jesus Christ. Hi, welcome to another podcast. That's Pa with a silent G on Unveiling Jesus Christ. Today we're going to be covering uh, Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. I'm John Cassinet. I'm your host as always, and uh, we're going to jump right into this podcast, but I'll warn you as we begin that uh, I've got some real fun images for you. Some of them a little crazy, and uh, but you know, you got to have a little fun here, so uh, bear with me. I don't have a a trailer that you can watch to see whether you should watch this whole podcast or not. (laughs) You're just going to have to take your chances. So we begin with Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. And it says, quote, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, close quote. Now, by way of reminder, uh, in last week's podcast, we talked about verse 11 that precedes this verse, where John had heard a trumpet-like voice behind him. And so in this verse, he's essentially turning to see the voice of the person that spake. He wasn't turning to see a trumpet. He's, he recognized that this trumpet, what he describes as a trumpet, is a symbol for the voice of the person that he heard. And so now he's turning to see who it is that was speaking to him. And as he turns, he doesn't immediately see Jesus Christ, although that is who eventually he's going to describe for us. But what he initially sees is seven golden candlesticks. Now, we need to actually replace the word candlesticks with the word lampstands. That better describes what John saw in his image. And so uh, we're going to put an image up of someone's idea of what John saw. Now, uh, this particular image, you you just kind of have to take it for what it's worth in terms of the accuracy of what is being depicted. But this gives you some sense. It's helpful to see First of all, for example, that there, we're talking here about lampstands uh, that support a candle. Uh, and so it's not like it's an actual candlestick or a candle that burns down and you have nothing left. It's like at birthday time, you know, when you wait too long to sing happy birthday, <laughs> the candles all melt and you got wax all over your frosting. So uh, these are not candles in the traditional sense. These are lampstands that it's despic- de- depicted here in this image. And so these seven golden candlesticks, as they are called, are going to represent the churches. We will be told this later on, but they represent the seven churches that hold up or bear the light of Christ and his gospel. And you can make a comparison between what is being talked about here with uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, that talks about uh, a famous, this is one of those scripture mastery scriptures, you're the light of the world, a city that cannot be set under a head, neither do men put a candlestick under the uh, under a bushel, etc., etc. And so that's what we're talking about here. And Jesus, of course, is the lamp. He is the light of the world, and the seven churches, which are the lampstands, then bear up his light. And so these are uh, uh, something that we're looking at here in this imagery. Now, it's important to note, of course, that anciently uh, the lamps were more commonly used than candles. The lamp comes from the Greek word lynchnia, which refers to the stand that support these oil lamps. Uh, that would be olive oil and the, the little lamps. In fact, I think I got one here. Yeah, see, so here, here's the kind of thing <laughs> that we're talking about. I'm taking from my props behind me. Uh, so this is the, the, the little lamp, and you'd pour the uh, olive oil in here. You'd put some kind of a wick down in here, a cloth of some sort, and the... Uh, cloth would suck up the uh, olive oil in the lamp 
and uh, would stay lit as long as you, of course, have the oil in it. And so that's essentially what we're talking about with the, the concept that on top of these lampstands, it wouldn't look exactly like this, what I'm showing you here. It would look like rather some type of bowl that simply is uh, sufficient to hold a certain amount of olive oil in it, and you can put the wick in it, and away you go. So that's, that's what the imagery is that you should be thinking about. Now on a broader scale, these seven golden candlesticks are in the likeness of what is known as the menorah. And uh, I want to talk about a little bit about what the menorah is, and then we'll make sure we distinguish it from the seven candlesticks that John sees in his vision. Now, the, the most notable thing that we're immediately going to recognize in those of you who are from, oh, I think I got a menorah around here. So. <laughs> I'm just going to grab my prop again here. So here's, here's the, the image of a, uh, a menorah. It has the, uh, the seven, seven armed candelabra. And uh, as you can see, the idea is you've got these candle, uh, the, the oil bowls at the top of the, uh, each arm, and you put the oil in here with a wick, and, and then they burn. And so this gives you an idea. I'm going to show you another image here in a second, but uh, there we have. It's a good thing we've got all these props here. I, I wasn't even thinking about that, but <laughs> so at any rate, um, the menorah, the, the distinguishing feature about it is, of course, it's a single stem that is uh, going to support uh, the six branches, three on either side, whereas in John's vision, what he's looking at is uh, seven golden candlesticks that each have their own stand. And this is a very important distinction, and we're going to talk about the, the difference in symbolism between these in just a moment. But let's first of all kind of give you a little bit more background into the concept here of the uh, menorah. <clears throat> so the in, in Hebrew, the word menorah means place of lights. It was a piece of furniture that was located in the holy place in the uh, tabernacle and in the temple at Jerusalem. So the holy place, of course, would be just before the veil of the temple with the Holy of Holies being on the other side of the veil. And uh, there were no windows in the, uh, the temple itself. And so the only source of light in the holy place was the menorah. And uh, so, you know, <laughs> kept people from stumbling over everything. So here's a, an image uh, that we've got of a statue of a menorah. And again, uh, the distinguishing thing that you can see about it is the long stem. Now, uh, this the uh, image that you're looking at of this particular statue is uh, probably oversized, but the menorah was actually quite large. It was made from a, a talent of pure gold, which, depending on how they measured it, is probably somewhere between about 44 and 88 pounds of gold. And so naturally, me being the financial wizard, I think about wonder what that means works out to be in today's prices. And so I, <laughs> I checked on uh, my phone to, to find out what gold is going for today in today's market. And it was at $2,040 an ounce. And there's, of course, 16 ounces in a pound. So you do the math and you come up with somewhere between $1,436,000 and $2,872,000, depending on whether the talent is closer to 44 pounds or whether it's closer to 88 pounds. So that gives you just some sense of the uh, amount of gold that it took to actually create uh, the menorah. The gold, of course, itself is a symbol for purity uh, preciousness, sacredness, and incorruptibility, uh, and it's probably the most frequently mentioned precious metal in the Old Testament. Now, the actual uh, dimensions of the menorah were that it, uh, and this is something as described by Josephus, and I'm going to talk about who this guy is in a second, but he set the dimensions of the menorah at about five feet high and three and a half feet between the outside branches. And that's something that's also confirmed by various rabbinical sources as well. Now, if you look back on the image of the menorah, 
uh, we're looking at the uh, central shaft and all of these branches have various uh, artwork and shapes that have been engraved into them and would have been engraved into the gold uh, that we just talked about. But the central shaft had four almond-shaped bowls, four round knops or knops, uh, and four flowers. So you had a t total of 12 things that were carved into the central branch. And then each of the six branches had three bowls, three knops, and three flowers for a total of 54 on the six. And so if you, now keep in mind the 12 images in the single stem, 12 is, a, is an important symbolic number having to do with priesthood. We call it sometimes the church number, things like this. And so all of these things have a certain element of uh, symbolism associated with them. So you add the 12 s symbolic images that have been engraved into the gold um, on the stem plus 54 in the arms for 66 in all, which seems like a little bit of a weird number. And actually Josephus lists the total number of decorative items at 70. So somewhere along the lines, in addition to the uh, 66 that uh, are obvious to be seen, he identifies that there were four additional things that uh, somehow were decorative engravings, bringing the total number to 70, with seven, of course, being the number of perfection, wholeness, completeness, multiplied by 10 to give it a kind of superlative quality. Now, I've mentioned Josephus a couple times already, and uh, he's going to come up again. So I want to give you just a little bit of sense who he actually is. He's actually uh, a Roman Jewish historian who lived during the first century AD. So he was an eyewitness to things like the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And we call him a Roman Jewish historian because he was actually a Jewish general in the first Jewish war that began in 66 AD and ultimately led to the destruction of Jerusalem. But the town that he was in the generalship of uh, was subdued and he eventually surrendered to the Romans in his city. And after surrendering to the Romans, uh, he became somewhat disillusioned with his countrymen and their uh, willingness to basically fight to the death at all costs uh, as they were basically being slaughtered by the Romans. And so he kind of decided, you know what, this is not for me. And so he actually defected after surrendering in about 67 AD and he became a slave to Vespasian who was the Roman general who began to, the attack on Jerusalem. And eventually, uh, he would become the emperor before 70 AD. And that's the reason why <clears throat> his uh, role as the general was turned over to Titus. Um, and uh, Titus becomes the great conqueror of Jerusalem because uh, Vespasian had to basically run back to Rome and secure his throne as the emperor in Roman. And at the time that uh, Vespasian went back to Rome and ultimately does become the uh, Roman emperor, he gave Josephus his freedom and made him a Roman citizen. And so Josephus then took on the name of Flavius Josephus. And Flavius was the family name of a dynasty of Roman emperors that began with Nero, then passed to Vespasian, then passed to Titus, and then passed to Domitian. And so all of these relatives um, were the Flavian dynasty that began in about 54 AD and continued until the death of Domitian in about 96 AD. And that time period, again, as you've heard in other uh, podcasts, coincides with the uh, uh, the first the banishment of John on Patmos Island and ultimately his release from the island when Domitian died in about 96 AD. But Josephus, uh, because of the time that he lived in, his connections both in the Jewish community and then later on in the Roman community, uh, was a, uh, a perfect person and candidate to write the history of the Jews. And so he wrote two different histories, one called the Jewish Wars and the other one called the Jewish Antiquities. And it's basically uh, the history in that period of time 
more or less from a Jewish perspective, and it's the most important history that we have of the first century. And that's why you'll hear people all the time talking about uh, Josephus and uh, the things that he's written. And uh, sometimes, candidly, uh, he can be a little bit verbose. <laughs> It's better to read what other people have said about what he said than to try and read his uh, the Jewish antiquities and Jewish wars. They can, uh, they're, it's a daunting task, let me just put it that way. But at any rate, um, that's a little bit about uh, Josephus. Now, the other thing that I just want to mention about the menorah in terms of its structure and uh, construct is that sometimes you will see the menorahs, quote-unquote, that has eight arms with four on each side of the stem for a total of nine candles. Now this is not the true menorah, but you'll see them quite a bit. And uh, a lot of times they are the piece of furniture, whether it be decorative or whatever, um, that will actually be lit and will be lit inside homes, including the Jewish homes. And the reason why the, the menorah, the, the household version, if I can say it that way, the household version of the menorah has nine candles because it, the Jews were forbidden to light the menorah outside the temple. And so the only place where the menorah with the seven stems on it was lit by the Jews was in the holy place. Outside, they would use the nine-stemmed, quote-unquote, menorah um, for household purposes. And so that's why, that's why you see the difference between nine and seven. Now, the menorah uh, finds its place. I'm going to show you an image of the Arch of Titus at Rome. And uh, if you look carefully on this particular image, what you're going to see is the depiction of the Romans carrying home to Rome the menorah. And so what happens, this, <clears throat> this is related to the conquest of Titus, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. So after he destroyed the, uh, the Jewish people, literally, in, in addition to just the city and the temple, um, he, he came home, uh, hail the conquering hero, da, 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 you know, that sort of thing. And so as he was coming into uh, Rome, you know, there were all kinds of celebrations and everything. And eventually this great uh, arch was constructed at Rome. And in that, in the engravings of this arch that you can see is a uh, relief of the menorah being carried into uh, Rome in celebration. So that's uh, a place where you can also see the image of the menorah. Uh, the, the menorah itself is uh, commonly recognized as being a representation and being a symbol that is associated with the tree of life. So I'm going to throw up another image. And what this looks may look like to you is an image of a large ball of tree roots. And that's exactly what it is. <laughs> uh, this is not the tree of life. But as I was looking for a nice image about the Tree of Life, I happened to come across this interesting ball of roots that I found rather fascinating. And, and I liked it so much, I decided to include it. <laughs> so you just have to use your imagination that this big ball of roots from this massive tree is the Tree of Life. But uh, it's not. But uh, uh, essentially, the, the Tree of Life, we have it in, uh, of course, the description of Lehi and his vision of the tree of life. Um, there was a discovery in, uh, in Latin America of Stella V that is a pretty famous relief of the uh, tree of life. And so it's a, a pretty common symbol, well recognized uh, in many different cultures and religions. And so uh, getting back to uh, other things now, um, in terms of the uh, menorah itself and these seven candlesticks that we're talking about, we of course recognize that the pure olive oil in the cup-shaped containers in each branch represent the Holy Spirit and things which then illuminate all the things of God. We find the imagery used, of course, in the parable of the ten virgins and the foolish virgins who weren't wise enough to make sure that they had sufficient oil so that they could burn their lamps throughout the evening until the uh, bridegroom appears after his uh, wedding. Uh, the, these candlesticks, of course, 
um, tie us into the temple imagery. And so in the Temple of Solomon, for example, uh, at the time that that was constructed and they were dedicate, dedicating the structure, Solomon ordered that 10 lampstands be placed in the Holy of Holies. And uh, so 10, of course, is another one of those fairly symbolic numbers that uh, is a representation of a whole of a part. And uh, that would have been the reason why 10 would have been chosen at the time of the dedication. But at any rate, here there's <clears throat> we have seven separate lampstands that we have to distinguish from the menorah that has this single stem that support the other six arms or branches of this uh, tree of life. Uh, the, we're told later in Revelation chapter 1 verse 20 that the, uh, the seven candlesticks represent the seven churches of Asia with the idea that from these churches representative of the universal church, we have an illumination of the word of God to all the world. And uh, the, the idea of the seven means that we are, are missing a unification among the Jewish, among the uh, seven separate churches. In other words, they are not united in one and each has its own candlestick and its own base that supports it as in contrast to the menorah that has the single stem that then supports the six. That would be an image representing the unity that existed in the Jewish church and among the uh, Israelites before we ever get to the point of having Jews per se. Uh, we had the, the Israelites all connected and bound by uh, their devotion to Jehovah who represents this, this stem that supports all of them in a sense. Uh, whereas by the time we get to 96 AD, after uh, the Savior's mortal ministry, after his death, crucifixion, his resurrection, uh, and uh, we have the apostolic period when uh, the church was under the direction and central authority and leadership of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, the correct image would have been the menorah with the single stem. But as time went on, of course, the 12 apostles were killed and there ceased to be this type of central authority and leadership within the church so that every branch, wherever it might be located, was pretty much doing their own thing and was under the authority of the local bishop. And so the existence of the seven candlesticks as independent candlesticks that have their own base is essentially a symbol of an apostate condition among the churches uh, because they're, we're supposed to have one Lord and one faith and one baptism, uh, but those kinds of conditions really didn't exist as of the time of John's vision in 96 AD. And so that's the distinction that we have to draw between the menorah on the one hand and these seven candlesticks on the other hand. Now it's important to note that these seven uh, golden lampstands were in fact actually made of gold. So John describes them as gold in appearance, but we have to understand that they were made of actual gold. Uh, gold being of course a sacred metal, it shows that they were precious in the sight of God. And if we only had golden lampstands that had the appearance of gold, then that would be a sign of evil or hypocrisy, kind of point, putting yourself out there as though you were real gold when in fact you're essentially fool's gold and uh, that would be a representation of evil. And so we're gonna find gold cropping up all over the place as we go through the book of Revelation and we always have to distinguish between what is genuine gold as a representation of sacredness and uh, something of great value and something that only has the appearance of gold which is very evil and uh, hypocritical in the uh, best sense of the word or the worst sense of the word I probably should say. Um, so note, notice how I mentioned a moment ago that the fact that there were seven candlesticks with separate supports or bases was an indication that these churches were in an apostate condition. And as we go through and study the uh, seven churches 
five of the seven were condemned by the Savior for not having, uh, well, ha having a lot of bad things about them. Only two of them did he uh, commend without condemnation. And so uh, that's another indication of kind of the apostate condition that existed among the seven churches. But nevertheless, nevertheless, we have these seven lampstands that are still gold in their appearance. In other words, they were still precious in the sight of God, even though they were a far cry from uh, a level of perfection or where they needed to be in terms of their faithfulness and their keeping of the commandments. So that's, uh, that's what I wanted to talk about with regard to Revelation chapter 12. Let's move on now to Revelation chapter 1, verse 13, which says, quote, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Close quote. The first phrase we want to address with regard to this particular verse is the phrase that says, in the midst of the seven candlesticks. And so <clears throat> we know, as the later portions of the verse describe, this is Jesus Christ, and he's in the midst of the seven candlesticks. So we want to talk a little bit about what that actually means. It means essentially that Christ is standing or walking among these universal churches that are represented by the seven lampstands, and he is encircled by them, all right? And this image is not unique to the book of Revelation. We find it also in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, verse 13, which says, quote, The light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed, even the power of God, who is in the midst of all things, close quote. So again, we get this imagery of the, uh, the Savior and his power being in the midst of all things, including uh, the universal church, both anciently and in modern times. We also find this same imagery used in Revelation 2, 1, which says, quote, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, close quote. And of course, this is a reference to uh, the letter that uh, John wrote to uh, the church at Ephesus, uh, which was having some problems and had some apostasy occurring among them. They, they weren't all bad. There were a few good things that he commended them about, but uh, they had some work to do. And, he, and yet it describes the fact that he's walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, including in this particular verse, the church at Ephesus. And so it is for us today. I, I think we need to dispel the notion that uh, Jesus will only walk in our midst, both collectively and individually, if we're somehow perfect. And uh, uh, that's just not the case, as demonstrated by what's going on here. Uh, with these seven churches, most of whom were really on the verge of going uh, into apostasy completely. He's still in their midst, nurturing, doing the best, doing everything he can to help them in whatever difficulties and trials and tribulations they, they might be encountering. And so, so it is with us that uh, even though we have difficulties, even though we're not perfect, um, he will be in our midst, and that's his uh, promise to us. Now, some have suggested with regard to the layout of these seven lampstands that there were two rows with three on one side, and then Christ, and then on the other side would be the other four lampstands or candlesticks. So let me put up that map of the seven cities that I've shown you in some of the prior podcasts. You'll notice that uh, on the coast of the Aegean Sea, you have the three cities starting with Ephesus in the south, then Smyrna and Pergamos, up the, on the, which is the northernmost city. Uh, so you have three along the coastal area. And then if you go inland, you've got the other four going again down from Pergamos down to uh, Laodicea as the last city of the four on the inland route. And so you know, if the seven candlesticks truly represent the seven cities and is in any way tied to 
the geographical location of the seven cities, then it might make some sense that what John was seeing was three on one side of the Savior, four on the other, kind of in a row with him in the midst of them. It, so it's a plausible uh, deduction, I think. The, the Lord, of course, likes order. He likes the arrangement of three by four. We've, it comes up a lot of times in di different places in the book of Revelation. So even though we're not given any specific information about the arrangement of these particular candlesticks, it would seem to make sense that that could very well be a plausible indication of what it may have looked like for John. And so, so much for our <laughs> the image that I put up earlier because uh, it, uh, it's not arranged three by four, but uh, it's just somebody's idea. Okay, the idea is I want to just give you a sense of what, what John is saying, and we, we don't know enough about it exactly to know, so we'll leave it at that. So notice that it says that he is in the midst of the, uh, the seven candlesticks. This is a promise that uh, exists uh, in Latter-day Revelation, for example, in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 38, verse 7, it says, quote, I am in your midst and ye cannot see me, close quote. In Matthew 28, 20, going back into the New Testament, he says, and this was at the time of his uh, ascension into heaven, he said, quote, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, close quote. And of course, he's always in our midst by the power of his spirit. He is in our midst by the ministration of angels. He's also said in Matthew 18, 20, quote, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them, close quote. And so that's fairly familiar scripture that we, I think we all have some recognition of. And this actually comes from a rabbinical saying. So when Jesus was saying that uh, if two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in the midst of them, there was a rabbinical saying to that effect. And the rabbinical saying was, quote, where two or three are together to study the Torah, which is the law of Moses, the Shekinah is in their midst, close quote. So that's what the rabbins would say. And this is what Jesus may very well be referring to uh, as uh, in Matthew 18, where he talked about the gathering of two or three people together. And so the, uh, of course, the Shekinah is a tra English transliteration of the Hebrew word that means dwelling or settling or habitation. It was associated with the tabernacle um, and in specifically in the uh, Holy of Holies with the uh, Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, the Shekinah or the presence of God like a cloud would descend and rest on the mercy seat. We also find its presence for example, in the uh, wilderness wanderings of the Israelites for 40 years, the, the cloud of the Lord's presence would go before them, kind of showing them the way. And uh, so essentially you'd recognize that the cloud kind of covers his glory, but it is a representation or symbol of his presence. And so finally, let me end with last one last one in the uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 32.3. It says, quote, and I myself will go with them and be in their midst, and I am their advocate with the Father, and nothing shall prevail against them, close quote. So that's kind of a, a soothing thought that we, a lot of times we talk about the book of Revelation being this thing that just got really all these really bad and ugly things that happen, and, and they do to a certain extent. <laughs> Uh, but there's they, we always have these verses that we sometimes just kind of pass over and say, okay, Christ will be in the midst of the people. Okay, good, happy to hear it. Uh, and without recognizing that there is a, a uh, promise of protection associated with that. And that's what we find in this uh, verse in uh, the 32nd section of the Doctrine and Covenant when he says, I'll be in their midst, I'm their advocate, and nothing shall prevail against them. And that, I think, relates both to certainly spiritual things and maybe to a lesser extent temporal things as well. So if you want to get some insurance, uh, you know, live your life in conformity and that you have the assurance that he will be in your midst. You don't have to be perfect, as I said, but uh, keep your life in conformity with his teachings and you have the promise that he will be with you. So this image is, by and large, a source of comfort to the saints both anciently and today. And keep in mind that Christ uh, throughout the book of Revelation at least seven times tells us, I come quickly. And that's literally true because 
technically speaking, he's already here. He's shown himself to be in the midst of the seven churches, even as John's prophecy begins. And so to say that I come quickly is an indication that it's already happened. It's, if you live your lives in such a way to enjoy the, the blessing of his presence, the Shekinah, then, uh, then he's already in your midst. And of course, that doesn't come without certain conditions of faithfulness on our part. As I've, I've already said, we have to endure and we have to keep the commandments and be watchful or the, the threat or the promise uh, is essentially that he will remove himself from you. His presence will not be with you. And we find this recorded in Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. And again, this is part of the letter that John was writing to the saints in Ephesus. And it says this, quote, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent, close quote. Now, this is relating specifically to the fact that if you don't keep the commandments, if you don't return to your first works, your first love, as the Savior talks about in regard to the Ephesians, um, I'm, we're going to take the church organization completely away. Well, implicit in this statement is if the church is removed out of its place, except they repent, then the Savior goes with it, right? He, he can't be in the midst of a candlestick that doesn't exist. And so in order for Christ to be in the midst of the candlestick, specifically in this birth with regard to the Ephesians, then they have to repent. And if they don't, candlestick goes away and he goes with it. Why? Because the church holds up his light. If you don't have a church holding up his light, he won't continue to be in the midst of them. So that's the, that's the hope that is offered by these verses and the imagery that we're looking at. But it's also a uh, word of warning to the wise of living yourself and your lives in such a way that you can have him as a blessing, his presence in your midst. Now, the next phrase of this verse uh, talks about the fact that John saw one like unto the Son of Man. And we've, I've kind of been implicitly talking about Christ being in the midst. And, and here we have the specific part of the verse that refers to him as the Son of Man. So this is a designation of Jesus Christ. And when it says Son of Man, it basically means the Son of the Man of Holiness. It is synonymous with the Son of God, who is the son of the eternal father, whose name is Elohim. And so Christ was the son of man in both a literal sense and in a spiritual sense. And by that, I mean to say he's the son of the man of holiness as his first begotten son in the spirit. And he's also the first and only begotten of the father in the flesh. That makes him in two senses the son of the man of holiness. Now, the Savior is also sometimes called uh, another related name, which is the son of Ammon, A-H-M-A-N. And you'll find that various references uh, in the use of this name in several sections in the Doctrine and Covenants. And in the pure language of Adam, the name of God is Ammon. And so since Jesus is his son, he would be the son of Amen. Now, this meaning that we're talking about as Jesus, who is the Son of Man, uh, has been lost to a number of people, uh, particularly the translators uh, of the Bible. Because if you look at the Bible and how it uh, sets forth the name and title of Jesus Christ as the Son of Man, they use a lowercase m on the word man. So you have son of man, son is capitalized, but the word man has not been capitalized in the King James Version of the New Testament and the Old Testament for that fact as well. So it, it should be the son of man with the word man capitalized because it is both a proper name and a title for Jesus Christ. So if you do a comparison, and you look at the King James Version of Matthew, 
chapter 16, verses 13. This is the, the chapter and verses where we're, Peter's being t told by the Savior that uh, he promises them the, the keys of the kingdom. But in this particular verse, verse 13, you'll find a reference there to the Son of Man with the lowercase m on the word man. Well, when Joseph Smith did his inspired translation, that verse becomes Matthew 16, 14. And in his inspired translation, he changed Son of Man to be Son of Man with a capital M to correctly identify uh, that phrase as both a name and a title for Jesus Christ. Now, another thing that we should note before we pass on to another subject is this, the verbiage in this verse that describes the John saying one like unto the Son of Man. And it's this like unto that may imply that John didn't see the Son of Man, but rather one like him. So in other words, he was looking at an angel that just had the appearance. He seemed like he was the Son of Man, but he wasn't in reality. And don't get hung up on that because John, in fact, did see Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. And this phraseology uh, of like unto is kind of common in other scriptures where it's clear that the person being described is the Savior, or in the case of Abraham 327, which describes the pre-mortal existence, it uses the same phrase to describe Jehovah. And so it says, one like unto the Son of Man. And so this was with reference to the Grand Council when Jehovah was presented, and it describes him as the Son of Man. Uh, we also find similar imagery in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, which is Daniel's description of the gathering at Adam on Diamon. And he says, quote, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, close quote. And that's a clear distinction, a clear indication and something that no one within the church disputes that what John was seeing, or what Daniel was seeing, in connection with the gathering at Adam on Diamon was the Savior coming to that great gathering where he would receive the keys from the key holders of all dispensations, etc., etc. So uh, again, the, the terminology or the phraseology is one like unto or like the Son of Man, but they clearly we're talking about the Savior. And the only time that you kind of need to distinguish that is uh, that sometimes, frankly, 90 times <laughs> in the book of Ezekiel, it's used as a greeting that applies to Ezekiel as the, as a, as the son of man, um, and not the son of God, but the son of man a, of, with a human father. And so it's, it's more in the sense of a greeting. And it's not difficult to distinguish when the Son of Man uh, name title applies to Christ versus something that is used as a common greeting to someone who is a mere mortal. And so th those are just some points to be made in that regard. Now, this Son of Man name title uh, for Christ is found in all four standard works of the uh, the Bible and Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, New Testament, Doctrine and Covenant. So every one of them uses this title. And in about 90 or in about 70 separate places in the New Testament itself, Jesus himself uses this term, this title to describe or identify himself. The title is often associated with Christ's second coming. And since the second coming is a time of judgment, it's a common name that is applied to him where judgment is concerned. And so one of the other things that we find in the, uh, in the New Testament and in other scriptures is the, a reference to the sign of the Son of Man. And this is the last sign that will be given just before the coming of Christ at the time of the second coming. And so, for example, we find in uh, Joseph Smith, Matthew 136, it says this, quote, after the tribulation of those days and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, close quote. 
So that's Joseph Smith's translation, of course, of uh, Matthew chapter 24, or one verse thereof. Now, we also find reference to this sign in Revelation 15, 1. Uh, and John says there, quote, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God, close quote. Now, notice here, in John's description of this sign, he describes it as another sign. He also says it's great and marvelous. So he doesn't say specifically, this is the sign of the Son of Man. But when we get to Revelation 15, 1, I'm going to discuss this in great detail. But for now, just kind of take it on faith that Revelation 15, 1 is also describing the great and marvelous uh, sign that we recognize elsewhere in other scriptures as the sign of the Son of Man. Now, this is, I just want to pause here for just a second and step back from this and, and help you understand the significance of uh, these particular terms and their usage, because I like to refer to the book of Revelation, and if you've been in a fireside with me, um, you've heard me talk about the Rosetta Stone and how the book of Revelation is really a, a Rosetta Stone that allows us to understand things in our modern scriptures and in other scriptures that we don't seem to get or make the, connect the dots because we don't often have time frames associated with them. So in uh, Joseph Smith Matthew 136, where it talks about after the tribulation of those days. Well, what days exactly uh, are we talking about? We know this sign needs to be something that happens uh, immediately before the second coming, but where exactly does it fit in? And Revelation 15.1 answers the question because John gives all kinds of context of events that happen, and then he identifies this sign in Revelation 15.1, and then he goes on in great detail and describes certain events which are going to happen after the sign is given. And so essentially we know from John's writings and his prophecy that the sign of the Son of Man will be given at the end of the second woe and the start of the third woe according to John's descriptions of those events. And so what we have here, because of the chronology that John sets forth in the book of Revelation, it, it's like this Rosetta Stone that opens up this whole world of understanding to revelations and prophecies that we have about the signs of the time and things that are going to happen during the great winding up scene. And we now understand them contextually and chronologically because of the detail that John gives in his. So we'll get to that in more detail right now, but I just, I couldn't pass this opportunity where we're talking about the sign of the Son of Man without pointing out that John tells us exactly when that's going to happen and can give us some definite understanding as to the chronology. Okay, moving on, as we continue our discussion of uh, this verse, the next phrase talks about the Savior being clothed with a garment down to the foot. Now, this long garment to the foot identifies Christ as both a king and a priest. So it was the practice anciently for kings and priests to wear these long trailing garments uh, to, for distinction and to bring about a sense of dignity to them. And so, you know, in today's society, you have, uh, when you're getting married, uh, uh, the, the bride always has this long trailing uh, uh, garment that she's wearing. I remember, uh, you know, when uh, at the time Prince Charles and Diana was married, who, who didn't watch at least part of it, right? I mean, I'm not uh, a, a big watcher of the royals, but uh, essentially I did kind of tune in. And that was quite a wedding dress, you know, the, uh, the tail on that dress. I don't think it's supposed to be called a tail. It tells you how little I know about women's fashions. But at any rate, uh, the tables were reversed a little bit. Back in the olden days, if you had a long trailing garment, uh, that was for kings and priests uh, and a, uh, a distinction and a dignity. And uh, so the, the, the long garment, of course, is also a symbolic representation of their righteousness, which is indicated by the garment as well. And so this is kind of a clear allusion to the garment of the priesthood. And it describes specifically the garment that would be worn by the high priest in Israel, who was a representative or symbolic type 
for Jesus Christ. And so the high priest would be wearing his sacerdotal or priestly robes, also called vestments. Now the word sacerdotal comes from the Greek word sacerdos or sacerdos, signifying that which is sacred or holy. And so this type of dress that is being described in this particular verse would be limited to someone who would qualify as the high priest. And uh, you, you couldn't copycat that, right? You, you wouldn't see people running around like this, uh, even on Halloween. Oh, I guess they didn't have Halloween, but you get the picture. Um, and so the clear indication is that not only have we identified Jesus as the Son of Man, but the garment that he is wearing is also a symbolic representation of him in his role as a king and a priest and the high priest uh, over Israel. And uh, so that's what we learn about in the sense from the, uh, what the garment means. Now, then we move on to note that he's, it's also a description that he is girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now, the word paps is kind of an archaic word. We don't use it anymore, really, but it's, uh, the, the meaning of it is essentially breasts. And so you had, what it indicates is that this golden girdle was tied around his chest. And uh, this is an allusion to a couple different things. One, the, the breastplate that would be worn by the high priest in ancient Israel with the gold, again, symbolizing that which is most precious, not just in terms of the value of the, the gold that would be used with this particular ornament, but the sacredness of it as well. And so the, the girdle of the high priest, uh, which is distinguished a little bit from the imagery we're looking at now, the girdle uh, would be made of fine twined linen embroidered with needlework. But here, the clasp, as we could call it, or the girdle, was entirely of gold. And it's from Josephus that we learn that the high priest girdle in his day was just interwoven with gold. And so it's not, you get this step up in using this past imagery, but it's stepped up with not only is it uh, fine twine linen that is embroidered or interwoven with gold, um, but we have one that is essentially entirely of gold. And the fact that you have this golden girdle and the fact that it's tied about the chest is a mark of the importance of the office. So if the placement of the girdle is at the, the chest, that would be indicative of the way the high priest would wear it. Now, if you were one of the lesser Levitical priests who were just working in the tabernacle, they would have had their robes girded about at their loins, particularly when offering sacrifice. So as they go about their duties to offer sacrifices or whatever it is that they're doing, they would gird, they, they would kind of pick up their robes, tie them around their waist so that they wouldn't trip over them while they're working. But since the high priest was kind of the, the management and overseeing things, to distinguish him from others, his, his girdle would be worn at the chest and the others at their, their loins. And so again, the fact that this is at the chest is a representation of the divinity of the wearer. Okay, let's move on and talk a little bit about uh, Revelation 1, verses 14 and 15, which state, quote, His head and hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, close quote. So here we have a lot of different things that essentially describe the Savior, and this is why we can kind of uh, ignore any suggestion that this is some angel or anyone less than the Savior himself that is being described. We find a, a similar kind of description that has many common characteristics in Doctrine and Covenants section 110 verses 1 through 3. And in these particular verses, it's very clear that the Savior is being spoken of. And it says this, quote, The veil was taken from our minds, and the eyes of our understanding were opened. We saw the Lord standing upon the breastwork of the pulpit before us, and under his feet was a paved work 
of pure gold in color like amber. His eyes were as a flame of fire. The hair of his head was white like the pure snow. His countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and his voice was as the sound of the rushing of great waters, even the voice of Jehovah." Close quote. That, of course, is a description of the uh, visitation of the Savior at the time of the dedication of the temple in Kirtland. And again, because of the similarities in the description, it's obvious that what is being described in Revelation 1, 14 through 15 is a description of the person of Jesus Christ. And so we can gather that from the parallel citation in the 110th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. So let's talk a little bit about what some of these symbols actually mean, starting with the phrase, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. White, of course, as a color, is a symbol of light, purity, and triumph. Um, and so in ancient Rome, for example, if someone were a conqueror such as Titus, it was the uh, practice that the conqueror would wear a purple tunic with white and his wife and children wore right, white robes as well. They would be pulled in a chariot by a white horse and white bulls would be sacrificed in thanksgiving to the gods. And so all of these symbolism of white, again, confirming this concept that it represents light and purity, but also this concept of triumph, which applies, of course, to Christ. Because as of 96 AD, the time of John's vision, the Savior was triumphant in his atonement and his sacrifice upon the Christ. And so he was very much uh, an overcomer and someone who had triumphed. We find this uh, reference also in Revelation 3, 5, where it talks about how overcomers, uh, that is the saints, will be clothed in white raiment. And so this is where you, the, the white comes from the Greek word lekos, meaning bright or gleaming. And so the image that you kind of have to have in mind it, where it talks about his head and hairs being white, uh, like wool or snow, uh, it's, it's just this brilliant kind of glory. There is this certain splendor about his head in particular, which is a, this, this concept of the, the splendor that you see radiating from the head was called by the Romans nimbus, which means glory. And uh, if we take a look at this next image, I, I, I just pulled up something that I think is an image that's kind of common in a lot of ancient artwork where you see Christ having this halo or this, this light kind of about his head. Well, this is what the Romans would call nimbus, which is it's an expression in this artwork of the glory of Christ. And, it, you know, you find the same thing in... Uh, in the saints that have been deified um, in various churches and in other things. So uh, it's, a, it's represented around the heads of God, deified person, saints, etc. But, but this is the image that, uh, that we have of Christ. The concept that the, the hair of his head was white like wool is also kind of an emblem of his antiquity and evidence of his glory. Now I have to say, <laughs> Having grown up on a sheep ranch, uh, wool is not white. I, I have to tell you that. It's like the sheep get out there and that wool, their, their wool is like this filter system, like a HEPA filter system. Uh, the, the wind blows, the dust comes around. It just gathers in there. They're dirty. Okay, and so uh, let me throw up this, uh, this image just to illustrate my point. You've got these sheep that you can see in the, the foreground, and then in the background, you kind of see some snow. And you can see the distinction. Now, these are white sheep, right? They, they are a breed that has white wool, but the wool is not white because it's dirty. Um, and uh, I, I say that because, uh, you know, when we shear the sheep, and you get down below, you know, that first half an inch to, you know, three quarters of an inch, uh, and the wool underneath uh, doesn't get so much dirt, it is white. <laughs> and, uh, and it's clean. And I think there's something to be applied here where it says uh, white like wool. It is this, this cleanness. It is perfection. 
it's not something that is uh, subject to the uh, the filth of the earth and whatever else might be encountered and so when it's when it's clean yes it is white now the extreme whiteness uh, resembling snow is the purest kind of white and I I picked another kind of image here um, with this snow at night you can kind of see the light but you can see how beautiful this white uh, this white snow is and uh, you know having grown up in Wyoming I, I'm pretty much an expert on snow <laughs> as everybody would be in Wyoming. Uh, you know, it used to be when uh, people would ask for a tip, our common answer was don't eat yellow snow. <laughs> so, so that would that was always the, uh, the tip of the day. And, uh, you know, I have to tell you another little story here. Um, so I really love cold ice water right and uh, uh, we we bought one of these uh, pebble ice machines which are really a great invention until they break down which ours eventually did uh, and it happened just before christmas time and uh, so we, we now live in the environs of provo utah and uh, <laughs> when it broke down we you know we get snow around here and so because I didn't have my pebble ice machine, I went out to the, the snow where it was snowing. I got some fresh snow to add to my drink so I'd have a, a nice cold drink and Jan was giving me a hard time. What are you going on? That's dirty snow. I said, not dirty snow. I picked it from the top. <laughs> it's fresh. And so, you know, she, she doesn't understand the concept of the purity of white snow, I guess. What, what can I say? But anyway, my daughter, she's telling all my children about, you know, the crazy stunt I'm drinking snow water. And uh, so my daughter gifted me uh, for Christmas a, a six-month supply of pebble ice. <laughs> so if you go out in our deep freeze, you got this supply of pebble ice that I go and I break into virtually every day. But anyway, it's the gift that keeps on giving. What can you say, right? Okay, getting back to uh, more important things. Um, the, the imagery that we see associated with the Savior, with the, uh, the, the hair that is... Uh, white like wool and white like snow is similar to the description that is given of Adam who's called the ancient of days by Daniel in chapter 7 verse 9 where he says quote I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool his throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire, close quote. So notice here when Daniel, he had it correct. See, Daniel knows something about sheep because he said his hair was like pure wool, not dirty wool, but pure wool. So if you have pure wool, then it's white and it, you know, borders on this white snow that goes great with a nice cup of ice water. <laughs> If you ever need it and you don't have some pebble ice at hand. At any rate, this of course was a description of uh, Adam, who was the Ancient of Days at the time of the gathering at uh, Adam on Diamond, that is still yet future in, uh, in our day. And we'll be talking about that some more when we get to Revelation chapter 10. So the other point of description of the Savior it states that his eyes were also as a flame of fire. Now, this is essentially the symbolism that we're talking about here equates to this concept of burning, intelligence, omniscience, and knowledge. It's closely related to the symbolism of the all-seeing eye, or what sometimes is referred to as the eye of providence. Now, uh, we're putting up an image now of the do dollar bill, and on the back of our dollar bill, you have this all-seeing eye at the top of this pyramid. Um, now, it's accompanied by two mottos in Latin. One is annuit queptus, and that means he, or providence, favors our undertaking. So that's one of our mottos. So, you know, if you're a United States citizen, you may not know, but this is your motto, right? Uh, providence favors our undertakings. The second motto, uh, contained in that same portion of the dollar bill is Norvus Ordo Seclorum. And what that refers to or means is the new order of the ages. This comes from a Roman poet by the name of Virgil. 
and what it essentially means when you put together both the, the first motto and look at it from the standpoint of this motto is it essentially is describing the beginning of the new American era. And how do we know that? Well, part of it is because if you look at the bottom of the image, you'll see that there are some Roman numerals at the bottom of the pyramid. And those Roman numerals, uh, you know, I, I can't really read Roman numerals if they get much above 50. <laughs> Because I can't keep track of the C and what's an L and stuff like this. I mean, I got the, the lower numbers pretty good. But this particular number, which is includes an M, you know, that's a major problem for me. So I'm going to tell you what this number is, is 1776. And those of you who know your American history will recognize that that was the year, of course, with the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And so that's associated with the beginning of the new American era, and we find it on our dollar bills. Now, another place where we find the, uh, the image of the all-seeing eye or this eye of providence is on the temple in Salt Lake City. So it's, it's, there are two all-seeing eyes located on the exterior of the temple, as shown in this image. One is located on the center tower, which is kind of the second level at the top of these upper windows on both ends of the temple. It's also located on the interior of the temple in the garden room. Now we find references to this concept of an all-seeing eye in the Book of Mormon and in Latter-day Scripture as well. So for example, in 2 Nephi 9.44, we have a reference to the, quote, all-searching eye, close quote. The same thing you'll find in Mosiah 27, 31. In Jacob 2, verse 10, there's a reference to the piercing eye of the Almighty God. In Moses 7, 36, it says, mine eye can pierce all creations. Doctrine and Covenants 38, 2, mine eyes are upon you. This is a symbol that's all-seeing eye, particularly on the... Uh, the dollar bill is associated with Freemasonry, and sometimes the members of the church, of the early church in our dispensation, were accused of stealing some of the Freemasonry symbolism and using it, uh, particularly within the temple. But the fact that the all-searching eye and the piercing eye of the Almighty and mine eye can pierce all creations, etc., etc., all of these things come from the Book of Mormon, which came out in 1829, which predated by a long time any connection with mem that members of the church had with Freemasonry. And so if you wonder what Freemasonry is, I'm not going to go into a great dissertation on it. Just watch National Treasure and you get the idea with Nicolas Cage. About, everything's all about the signs and symbolism of Freemasonry and stuff like that. And in fact, they look at the bill to, to, with the all-seeing eye. But at any rate, um, the LDS scriptures kind of debunked that uh, theory entirely because these kinds of images already existed. At any rate, moving on, essentially we, when we have this concept of the, uh, his, the eyes of uh, the Son of Man being as a flame of fire, you have to envision this symbol of a bright, sharp, penetrating gaze. And... Uh, we still kind of use similar kinds of terminology now when somebody says he gave me a fiery look. <laughs> and so the other thing we sometimes do, you, you've seen this and I, you know, when I'm telling my children that I have my eye on and you, you do the two finger thing, you point your two fingers at your eyes and then you point them back at them like this. And, uh, and that's kind of like the all seeing eye. I see what you're doing. You can't escape my all-seeing gaze. And that's what my children were always supposed to understand. Even when I was at a far distance, I give them the two eyes, <laughs> the two eyes with the fingers. But at any rate, it also is a representation of piercing judgment. It, and this has both a negative and a positive connotation associated with it. So you've got the, the uh, all-seeing God, and because he sees all things, it puts him in a position to make righteous judgment. So that's a good thing. 
But at the same time, because he sees all things, including all sin, with these penetrating eyes that are like fire, they tend to consume evil and sin. And so that's not such a good thing if you're engaged in those kinds of activities. And we find the same symbolism uh, that we find here in Revelation 1, 14 and 15, again in Revelation 19, 12, where this is kind of illustrated in a negative kind of way. It says, quote, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And this is a clear reference to the second coming, which of course is a, a day of judgment. It's a great day for the, the good. It's a dreadful day for the wicked. And his eyes at that time are like this flame of fire. He sees everything, and he consumes all evil and the dross of this world that must be cleansed in order to usher in the millennium. All right, moving on. And now notice we're going kind of from top to bottom. We had the head, the eyes, and we're, we're continuing down now and the, the girdle and everything. Now we've reached our way all the way down to his feet are like unto fine brass. And when you think of these feet, uh, feet are always associated with the symbolism of subduing enemies. And so it was the common practice, uh, and we see it in the Book of Mormon, we see it uh, anciently in the, uh, the, the Old Testament, when you have someone who conquers an enemy, they find the leader, whoever he is, and you put his foot on, it, on his neck. I, you, you're subdued. When that happens, you're subdued. And so the imagery that we kind of have associated with here is the concept that Jesus has subdued his enemies and he treads them to powder with this consuming heat because this fine brass is something that exists only because it has gone through the fires of refinement to become fine brass. So we have to talk a little bit about what this concept of fine brass is. And frankly, it's a little bit of an indefinite term in the scriptures. It's not always clear what is being referred to when the word brass is being used. It only appears twice in the New Testament, and both of them are in Revelation, one here in Revelation 1.15, and then again in Revelation 2.18. Now, some have suggested that the, the reference to fine brass here in the book of Revelation is actually derived from a word, the word brass. If you break it down and try and figure out what it means, the, the closest that they can kind of come up with is it seems like it's half Greek and half Hebrew from the word chalcolabanus. And the chalcos is equal to brass, and then Laban is equal to white or whiten. And you put those two together, and then you have the fine or white brass. And uh, it's also possible, some say, that it has to do with these, this Corinthian brass. So this is a particular reference to a type of brass that came to exist when the city of Corinth was burned in 146 BC. Now, historically speaking, just a little bit here, um, the Battle of Corinth was a, a decisive battle that occurred when the Roman Empire defeated the Greeks and Achaeans and began the true domination of the uh, the Roman Empire. So it kind of was, you know, had been defeating countries and things like that. And finally, it begins to reach empire status. Um, and this was a decisive battle that led to the domination of Rome as a world power. Now, during this particular battle in 146 BC, the Roman general was a guy by the name of Lucius Mamias, and uh, as the defeat of the Greeks and Achaeans had occurred, he ordered that the city be burnt. And the city, of course, had gold statues and brass and silver workings and all these things together. And these metals, because of the heat from the burning of the city, melted together and created this alloy metal uh, that was uh, valued almost as much as gold itself. Uh, and uh, so some people think that the reference here in Revelation 1.15 to this, quote, fine brass, close quote, may be a reference to Corinthian brass, which was viewed as very, very valuable. 
So whatever the case might be, the, uh, the fine brass and the symbolism of the fine brass has kind of a technical uh, background uh, of one degree or another. And that makes some sense because those who were familiar with metalworking, such as people in Ephesus in particular, um, they would recognize what this would mean. So today the meaning may be lost a little bit, but for those metal workers anciently in Ephesus and in other places, they probably knew exactly what John was talking about in the imagery uh, and its meaning. And so brass, true brass uh, that we recognize today is an alloy of copper and zinc. And sometimes people will toss in a little bit of tin and it still gets called brass. But the, the true uh, brass is copper and zinc. If you put copper and tin together, melt them together, you would have bronze. And that's typically the case. And so uh, in order to achieve the, the brass metal, it has to be heated so that these metals are melted together. And then it becomes an alloy uh, that is very, very durable. And so what you have to take from this imagery where it's referring to uh, this brass is this symbol of something that is firm. It is strong. It's enduring. And so we find these various references in the Old Testament to things that are brass that have these kinds of qualities associated with them. So for example, the Psalms talk about the gates of brass. Uh, Micah talks about hooves of brass, like is in horses. Uh, Jeremiah talks about the walls of brass. Daniel, the mountains of brass. And what I find interesting kind of also is in the Book of Mormon, we have the plates of brass something that would be firm, strong, and enduring. And that was uh, literally the case on a more spiritual level because, you know, the, the sons of Lehi go back, they have to get the, the, the plates of brass. Why? Because we need them because the uh, things that are written on them are of great worth. And, uh, and so the Lord makes sure that whatever was written on there, and some of it, of course, is transcribed by Nephi in the Book of uh, Mormon, particularly long Isaiah chapters, came from the plates of brass. And so they are enduring, they're strong and uh, firm. And it's not just in a temporal sense like gates and walls and things like that, but in a spiritual sense as well. And so the, the, they have this uh, symbol of hardness uh, and insensibility to sin. So we think, find references in Isaiah to a brow of brass um, and other things like this. Now, <clears throat> we have to recognize in order to uh, get to the point where you have brass, we, we have to melt these metals together. And so we, we, it talks here specifically about this furnace uh, that generates enough heat. Uh, and it's so hot that it has to be this kind of a, a white heat. And so Daniel kind of uses this imagery in, in chapter 10, verse 6, where he says, describes this heavenly being whose arms and his feet like in color to polished brass. So it's not just that we have this uh, fine brass, uh, but it is white, it is polished, and has a luster about it, a certain glory. In Ezekiel 1-7, there's this description of these uh, living creatures, and he describes them, at, at their, in, when describing them, saying they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. Now, what I know about brass is, when I was in the military... <laughs> <laughs> you know, going through uh, officer candidate school in particular, and, and also with the basic school, you know, you got these uh, these brass ornaments for your um, for your uniforms, and uh, in particular, like your belt buckle, and you had to sit there and work on them forever, forever to try and get them so that they weren't tarnished. And if you had true brass, that's what uh, uh, it, what you'd have to put into it to keep it this kind of burnished or this polished brass. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. Uh, now, so in the <laughs> in more recent times, what you could do, but they wouldn't let us do it in Officer Canada, you buy anodized brass. <laughs> 
so it doesn't tarnish. And so at any rate, but they wouldn't let us use it back in those. So you're just sitting there polishing like crazy. And uh, uh, so you had to look good for inspections and stuff like that. But the idea is, is that uh, this fine brass that we're talking about really kind of means uh, a white brass because it was highly polished and refined to the uh, purest possible state of whiteness. Um, and uh, so that's the nature of these feet that uh, are glowing with great intensity from the midst of a furnace. Now, I'm throwing up an image of a blast furnace. Uh, this is kind of old school. You can see these guys standing next to the furnace, and I don't think they do it like that anymore. <laughs> today. I don't think OSHA will let them get away with these guys standing around trying to uh, push their rods down into this uh, molten metal that is just red hot and glowing um, to get rid of the, uh, the large chunks and impurities and the dross and uh, grosser elements and stuff like that. But at any rate, I throw this image up here because this is what I think about when I think about this fine brass and what it takes to create the kind of image that we're talking about, the refining process that brings about this state of purity so that John can describe it as basically this white brass or fine brass as the, the term is in uh, the King James Version. So when you get down to it, these feet uh, are eventually going to subdue the earth. It will burn all the earthly nations uh, and they will, these feet will tread upon the nations at the second coming. And Malachi 4, 3 kind of describes this a little bit when it says, Ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes <clears throat> under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this. Okay. Let's now go to the next part of this verse, which is a phrase that says, The voice of Jesus would be like the sound of many waters. And so what you should kind of envision it's this voice of a multitude. It's the power of his word like the sea. And the, the best image I can use to uh, kind of depict what is being described by this symbol, symbol would be an image of Niagara Falls. And uh, I've never been there, but, you know, <clears throat> everybody talks about how loud is the sound of all of this falling water, these many waters that flow millions of gallons a minute over the uh, Niagara Falls. So I had to, of course, Google it, Wikipedia, uh, and find out how loud is loud at Niagara Falls. And they say that it's about 96 decibels. It used to be more, but uh, they, they kind of pull some of the water out of the river for uh, hydroelectric uh, electricity generation. And so you don't have so much water flowing over as once flowed. I'm sure that there are people that were not happy with that choice. Don't mess around with Niagara Falls. But at any rate, <clears throat> so they say that it's about 96 uh, decibels, which uh, is not a safe level of sound. And exposure kind of on an ongoing basis would result in uh, hearing loss. And so just a little bit more to give you a sense of comparison, a whisper, something like this would be about 30 but a normal conversation is about 60 decibels. A motorcycle engine, kind of, if you're up close to it, is going to be about 95 decibels. And, you know, I think there's a big difference between some of these motorcycle engines. I mean, if you're talking like a, a 450 Harley Davidson, yeah, those things, <laughs> they're just made to create noise, right? And so, yeah, that's about 95 decibels. And if you get to 120 decibels with a loud noise, you're going to have immediate harm to your ears. As, as I was looking at these various things in these decibel levels, you know, it kind of amazes me that I can have, that I have any hearing in my ears at all. And I don't have the greatest hearing. I haven't quite gotten to the need for hearing aids yet, but uh, that day is coming, I'm sure. But, you know, when we were growing up, running this heavy uh, ranch machinery in the hay fields for all summer long, you know, we never wore hearing protection. <laughs> So, you know, kind of crazy, really. We should have, and you know, in hindsight, it probably should have been. Uh, well, not probably. We should have been wearing hearing protection, but we never did. And some of those, uh, that equipment was pretty noisy. And so I feel fortunate that I'm still hearing because I'm sure I had many uh, opportunities to receive 96 decibels worth of sound on kind of an ongoing basis. 
But at any rate, the, the image that you need to be taking away from this concept that the voice of Christ is as the sound of many waters, it's the sound of majesty and the power thereof. And you think of these waves crashing across the rocks in various places along the coast and just the sound that it creates. Uh, it's just really impressive. And you kind of have to be awe-inspired by those kinds of things. And that's the image you should be getting as John describes what uh, he's seeing and what he's hearing uh, in this vision of Jesus Christ as he turns to look to see the Savior, sees him in the midst of the seven candlesticks, and then hears his voice. And it is this majestic, powerful voice that is as the, uh, the waves crashing along the coastline or uh, the many waters. Uh, it's just kind of a deafening sound that cannot go unheard. It's not just loud, also it's clear, and it, it includes this sort of irresistible strength and power associated with it. And so essentially when you take all of these combined traits together, it presents this rather imposing and majestic image of Christ from head to toe, from fire to water, from the beginning to the end of the Alpha and Omega. And those are the images that you walk away from as we conclude our discussion of uh, Revelation 1, verses 12 through 15. So thanks again for uh, listening, and uh, I hope you'll subscribe to my podcast if you haven't already, and that you'll share this with your uh, friends, and thanks for the technical support by uh, Jenna Daly. We have another podcast coming up tomorrow. It's going to cover section eight in my book, so if you got it, you can review it in advance as kind of a roadmap for our discussion tomorrow. But the verses are essentially... Revelation 1 verses 16 through 18 and a discussion of the imagery of Christ holding these seven stars in his hand. So that's what we have to look forward to tomorrow. I will see you then.